May I ask your name and how you come to be here? Fascinating. Something very funny about him, if you ask me. Where ignorance is bliss, it is folly to be wise. You'll be here but a few minutes. I'll call you when we're ready. Now that I have caught your attention, you need not hold this melancholy place a moment longer. Well, Dick, this is going to be a bit of a surprise for you. A pleasant one, I hope. I was looking through some boxes of my stuff from Upton, and lo and behold, I found this. It's silent film, of course, but I got a chap who knows about these things to help me record this commentary while I watch the stuff. I filmed some bits of this, and so did you, very likely. Truth is, it's probably a bit of a dog's breakfast, because anyone and everyone had a go at it, and it's just been stuck together any old how. Added to which I expect we were all fairly well fueled. You know what it was like in those days. Anyway, I don't think anyone's looked at it since, um, where are we now, 1955. It's about 17 years, I don't think. Who's this? Oh, that, <laughs> that's you, Dick. You're very irritated. I don't know what's going on here. I just seem to be following someone around. Oh, good Lord, it's me. <laughs> and here's Elizabeth. I wonder if you can tell what she's saying. Let's just watch that bit again. Let's see. She's saying, hello, Peter. Is it? Hello, Peter. I can't make it out, really. Ah, here's a game of dominoes in progress, by the look of it. That's Bobby, I think, and Mother. The original notion of a bouncing bomb was conceived with the help of nothing more elaborate than a few glass marbles, a catapult, and a tin bath full of water. The idea was to make a specially designed spherical bomb that technically was more like a mine, which would skip over the surface of the water, sink in contact with the dam wall, and explode at a predetermined depth. Wallace had discovered during tests that for the device to ricochet correctly on the surface of the water and sink in contact with the dam, it would have to be spun backwards before being released from the aircraft. In December 1942, a Wellington dropped the first trial weapon at Chesil Beach in Dorset. Unfortunately, the welded hemispheres of the first bomb burst on impact with the water. But subsequent trials proved that the idea would work and Barnes Wallace went back to his drawing board to make the necessary modifications. On March the 21st, 1943, the staff and crews of a new specially formed squadron, number 617, had begun to gather at RAF Scampton in Lincolnshire. Wing Commander Guy Gibson, DSO, DFC and Bar, arrived to take command. He was just 24 years of age. Security was so tight that even Gibson was at first unaware of the targets or the unique weapon that was to be used. He was told only that the operation would not be carried out until May 
and that in the meantime low-level flying must be practiced at night. It was suggested that it would be convenient to practice over water, no more than that. But at 150 feet above the surface of Derwent Reservoir, near Sheffield, in an aircraft with a wingspan of 102 feet, that was enough to be getting on with. And that was only for starters. Even if Gibson's pilots could get it right during daytime practice, would it be all right at night, on a six-hour operation? And would maintaining the essential 60 feet release height ever be possible? At first, this seemed highly unlikely. No altimeter was accurate to such a precise degree. But an ingenious, yet basically simple solution was developed. Two powerful lamps were fitted to the aircraft, one in the front of the fuselage and the other towards the tail. The beams of these lamps shone downwards and were set to converge on the water when the aircraft was at exactly 60 feet. Name, Armstrong. Age, 41. Occupation, engineer. Coming from? Hazelmere. Going to? Dorking. Get your food. Why do you think they took that bloke to the emergency ward? Doctor thought he had scarlet fever. That's what I reckon. <coughs> when was the last time you did any engineering? <laughs> when was the last time you did any labouring? If ever. I'll work when I can get it. I'm not just a blasted moochie, you know. <laughs> Tell that to the Marines. You gave me your right name, didn't you? Yes. What's your all over, that is? Suppose you want to come back before the month's up. Let's see your name in the book. But I have no intention of returning here within a month. You have, I presume. Not particular, no. Right. First two for the bathroom. I declare it is so dark that an owl would be glad of a lanthorn. I all but walked in the river. Why had you not a lanthorn, my lord? Aye, with but a snuff of a candle I found. We have need of a link man. A link man? At home? Or a man who might serve as one. We have not sufficient servants, madam. It seems to me the house is kept in order, my lord. Aye, but what order? How many servants have we in this house, madam? A score? Two dozen? Thirteen. Thirteen? Why, then, tis no wonder I see them run about the place so much. T'other day, I saw the waterman running with two full buckets on a yoke and spilling half the contents on the floor. When I tasked him with it, he declared he had but a half hour to replenish basins and ewers throughout the whole house before he must needs be hewing wood. And after that, working in the kitchens, bringing down slops, and I know not what. They are pressed too hard, madam. This is delightful, is it not? There are views more delightful. And where may they be found? I gaze on one this minute. Delightful and beautiful. That is but your opinion, Mr. Congreve. It is most certainly not. You know that the members of the Kit Kat Club have a tradition of toasting the most beautiful ladies in Lucy. all England. Thank you, Lucy. Mr. Congreve could not retrieve the reticule because Mr. Congreve is not here. Her Grace is merely taking the air alone. 
for it is impossible that Henrietta, the second Duchess of Marlborough, should be seen in a compromising situation with someone who is not her husband. And so, her tirewoman must needs retrieve the reticule. Though in truth, I am not a tirewoman. Or lady's maid, as some now call it. Mistress Holloway is not well, and in such a case, I fill her place. Her Grace chooses me for the honour on account I can read. I would Mistress Holloway would sicken more often. For it is a change I much prize. To wait upon her Grace, instead of burning to a cinder in the kitchen, or wearing my fingers clean away with polishing and mending and I know not what. And those were the mainsprings that drove this entire affair. Money. And. Property. And ultimately, of even more significance, the question of who was to become the head of one of England's greatest families. Ah, yes. This is Roger. This photograph was made in 1854, and the art was still in its infancy then, but it's quite a clear portrait, don't you think? Ironically, perhaps, Roger was brought up in France by his French mother, who quite frankly stifled him with her affection. She cared little enough for her husband and the rest of the Tichborn family, but she doted on Roger. That, and her eccentric nature, did not make for a happy childhood. When Roger came to England at the age of 16, he spoke with a strong French accent, and he was occasionally made fun of. But when he joined the 6th Dragoons as a junior officer, he was made fun of a great deal more. Affairs of the heart turned out badly too, and finally, Sir Roger took ship for South America and freedom.